Of course, I'm writing all of this after the fact, so I'm skipping over what I consider mundane and focusing on what, in retrospect, was especially critical. So forgive me if I don't talk about my childhood, nice dinners, fights with my lover, my wife's sexual qualities, or lackluster sex. Our marriage had entered a long-term phase where we were both working to build up savings and children were on the cards. The first hint of trouble was enough to start worrying. It was a Thursday afternoon, and I had spent the week rebuilding an incinerator drive at a wastewater treatment plant in North Jersey. I got home on time. My wife called me a little after three to ask when I planned to return. This was common. Often I can't leave the job site on time, or there are traffic problems. Unfortunately, the connection was terrible, so I called her back using speakerphone, which was her work number. She's already gone for the day. Meanwhile, she called me back and I answered. Chris, are you okay? Ah, better communication now. I'm fine. Just left the work site and will be home in two and a half hours. Is there anything I need to bring? No, just yourself, love. Go ahead and buy some corn and tomatoes at the greengrocer. See you when you get there and dinner is ready. I arrived exactly a few minutes after my estimated arrival time, entered the house, and hung my windbreaker in the hallway closet. My wife called me from above and I shouted back a greeting. I don't want to sound grumpy, but there are only a few wooden hangers in that closet, and I always use one of them for my jacket. This time she was wearing a very expensive wool sports jacket. I tried it on and it fit well. Maybe a little short in the sleeves, but fine if worn with cufflinks. Inspecting it, I found that the pockets were filled with things, business cards, checks, and other things. Apparently someone named Robert Campbell purchased something from a Rite Aid pharmacy here in town at 3.12 p.m. that day. I hung it back on the hanger and closed the door. Okay, I'll soon find out what's going on. The wife came down the stairs, dressed only in a house lease, barefoot, her uncontrollable breasts bouncing. She was still wet from the shower. We kissed hello. If you think she wants to be erotic, you are not married. Women's underwear isn't particularly comfortable, and my wife doesn't wear it at home unless she's expecting company or going out. So she didn't mean anything by dressing like that. I thought she looked erotic, but I think she's hot no matter what she wears. Have you been home long? No, I'm ten minutes ahead of you. I've had a hard day, and I'm glad to be home in my living room. Let's put away the corn. We'll eat it tomorrow. I know I said I'd cook, but I didn't go shopping. So I ordered Chinese food. It should be here in half an hour. You don't mind, right? If I wanted to find fault, I would ask whose living room she spent time in, but that annoys people when you listen to what they say rather than what they mean. I collapsed into a chair. No, Chinese food is fine. So you worked in the office all day until it closed? She waved her hand, answering, Yeah, I told you. I was working on a new ad for a line of bath accessories. Honestly, it sucks but they're cheap, like in China, and they look good at first glance. Nothing I'd give a place in the house. I ignored the possible, probable lie about her whereabouts later in the day. We chatted for a bit until the food arrived. I paid the guy for delivery and we sat down to eat sea rice without the soy sauce to mute the seafood flavor. Steamed dumplings, crispy Singapore noodles, and crispy scalloped shrimp. I poured more tea and announced... I should probably call the police and report that our place was broken into. I even think I know who might have done it. She looked surprised. What? My God, how do you mean that? Simple, Karen. The thief was careless. Most of them aren't very smart, you know. He left his sports jacket in the closet. His name is Campbell. I guess the police won't have any trouble finding him. Oh, that sports jacket. It belongs to Bob Campbell. I brought it home from work. I need to return it tomorrow. I was silent for a while, which usually makes people nervous and makes them chatter. This time it didn't work with Karen, so I broke the silence. Ah, I assumed he was here. So why are you carrying his jacket back and forth? She got irritated. He left it in my office. So, you expected one of the cleaning staff to steal it and not a laptop or something that could be resold for a reasonable price? Chris, why are you questioning me about this? Sorry, it's just that your explanation is possible, but a little weird. Why would you bring someone's sports jacket home for, what, storage? Only to return it the next morning? 
Really? Do you remember Occam's razor? What's the most? Is the simple explanation that fits the observations most likely to be true? There is a much simpler explanation, but since you are my wife, I choose to accept your word that you were in the office all day until 5 Yao p.m., so we can forget about the simple explanation. I told you the truth, except that I didn't do anything in the office, so Jen, Howard, and I hold up in a cafe and work there for the rest of the day. Okay, I fell for it. What's the simple explanation? You and Mr. Campbell left work around 2.50 p.m. and came here. Since he planned to stay for a while, he hung his jacket in the closet. You called me to check that I was far from here, that the coast was clear, so to speak. He left a little later, forgetting his jacket. I'm guessing you were collaborating on Sudoku puzzles or something like that. Her face became tense. You're accusing me of cheating, aren't you? No, I'm blaming you for not telling the truth. I don't know the truth, but I think I know a lie when I hear one. How do you think a check stamped 3.12 p.m. from a Rite Aid pharmacy got into your jacket pocket? Let me see it. I handed it to her. The month date has an 8 on it, not a 9, so it's last month's check. Apologize. Handing the check back to me, I looked at it again. Well, it's ambiguous. Maybe an 8 or a 9. Sorry about that. As for your explanation, I said I take your word on what happened, and I meant it. You asked me to tell you the most simple, least absurd explanation, and what I mentioned would occur to anyone who doesn't trust you as much as I do. That's all. I received a gentle smile. I'm glad. I love you. I'm not cheating. What I told you is true. That night, I received comforting sex, which did not serve her purpose of convincing me. A better story would be if he left it at the cafe where they worked, but she couldn't say that because she had previously said that he left it in her office. I can guess what might have happened, but I don't really know what happened. And if I did, I would have to act on that knowledge. And let's be honest, I don't want this to be true. Damn, that was damn close. That idiot Campbell would forget his own name. Ha, assuming he ever knew it. In a scam, carelessness is dangerous, and he is careless. Why even keep that damn check? Hmm, okay, that didn't say condoms. I bet he didn't even look at it, just stuck it in his pocket. It was fun, but I think it's almost over. Chris got it. I got lucky and got out of it with a lie, so I got the benefit of the doubt. I can't play that card again. Chris, I'm not having a scam with Bob. I want you to know that. But it's nice to know you're jealous. Some things, like you, I don't like to share at all. I lay there collecting my thoughts. Karen, I married you forever. I expect you to bear my children and we will grow old together. I believe that's what you want, too. But if you ever change your mind, decide that I'm not for you, do us both a favor. Get a divorce ASAP. It would be painful for me, but no doubt I will eventually find someone else and move on with my life. I will accept it. We all make mistakes. It's just a question of admitting that we have irreconcilable differences. But please, please don't start cheating and expect to stay married to me or start a scam as a trial period for your freedom after divorce. I think I would take it very badly and wouldn't be able to treat your boyfriend kindly. Am I clear? Chris, I feel the same way. Okay, then we consider this issue closed. I love you, darling. Sleep. Apart from the sports jacket, our life seemed to be normal. As far as I could remember, nothing stood out and I was now observing. My business was doing very well. I kept two crews busy. But that meant I had to work alongside them most of the time, so I traveled more than I did in our salad days, to use the phrase my mother used for being too poor to put the meat on the table. Life seemed the same as before, maybe even a little better sexually. A month or so passed, and I supervised both of my crews remodeling equipment at a paper mill in Upper New York. The entire plant was closed for annual maintenance, and we received an early completion bonus, so we worked through the second shift for two nights in a row. We gave the go-ahead to heat up the oven at 11 p.m. Cleaning and packing the tools and a quick shower in the locker room took some time and we left the factory around 010, a day ahead of schedule. I collapsed at the motel for six hours of sleep, slept a little, and was on my way home by 0930.
I was looking forward to a relaxing ride from Wellsville, New York to Philadelphia. The route took us through some of the most beautiful countryside in the United States. Some people play golf to relax, some people listen to music, and I like to drive on country roads. Upper New York experienced two booms. The first occurred after the Revolution, when the Indian farms were taken by the whites, and continued until the time of the construction of the Erie Canal, and lasted until the Civil War. There was an agricultural boom that coincided with the Greek Revival period in American life, and the towns founded during this period were given names like Homer, Marathon, Ithaca, Syracuse, all ancient Greek names, and farmhouses were updated with square columns on the corners, etc. D. The collapse came when railroads came through, which could ship Midwestern produce to the East Coast cheaper than it could be grown in central New York. The second boom came in the early 1900s, this time industrial. It began when Niagara Falls began producing unprecedented amounts of cheap electricity. Cities flourished in the beau art and art nouveau styles, mainly in public buildings. This continued until the 1950s. Now the area is falling into disrepair, with Greek revival buildings slowly crumbling and 1890s buildings proudly carved with the names the Corn Bank or Farmer's Bank in terracotta standing empty. However, the land is beautiful. Most of the time I have to drive on the interstates, which is work. But taking rural roads, where you never know what's around the corner, calms me down. I followed the Susquehanna on State Highway 706, which follows Indian trails. Great. Below Tawanda, I stopped to see the French Asylum, where supporters of the French monarchy built a small village in 1793 for Marie Antoinette and other royals to take refuge there if they were able to escape the French Revolution. Unfortunately, she did not escape the Revolution. The guillotine caught up with her first, and time destroyed much of what the French loyalists had built. I stopped by, paid a nominal fee, and deposited a receipt from a very bored guy at the entrance. Unfortunately, there was practically nothing there. Nice walk along the Susquehanna River to look at a foundation or two of 1790s buildings and some beautiful Greek Revival-style buildings built 25 to 50 years later. But the day was a little cold, so was glad to get back in the car to finish path through the park until he found a path leading back to the road and continued on his way home. I arrived around 2 quarter p.m. and had to drive past my apartment and around the corner to find a parking spot. There was no seating in front of the house which was a bit unusual for a Thursday afternoon. I was dead tired and left my things in the trunk, went into the house, went to the toilet, drank a glass of water and decided to take a nap so that I would be in shape for when my wife returned home around 5 p.m. I didn't even take off my shoes. I just lay down on my back on top of the bed spreed, folding my hands like a dead man's. I started and woke you up to noise in the living room. Everything was quiet, but something woke me up I slept for about an hour. Here, a whisper of voices. Who the hell is in the living room? It's too early for the wife. I quietly walked down the carpeted hallway past the front door and looked into the living room, expecting to see a drug addict. But instead, I saw some guy having sex with my wife. I'm usually not aggressive. I've never hit anyone since I was 15, but this, this made me angry. I grabbed the walnut stool my uncle had made turned it over and brought it down on his head as hard as I could. She screamed, he weakened, and his head slid to the inside of the sofa. I saw with horror that it seemed her nose was broken. He was lying on her, motionless. What the hell have I done? I was horrified by what I had done, calling me a coward. But I was scared. Hell, I better cover my tracks and pretend I'll be back at five ways p.m., closer to my usual time sitting in the car for a minute, thinking, now, let's not be hasty. I'm pretty sure no one saw me come or go. Fine. The police probably won't search too hard, and if they do, probably no one will remember seeing me. God, I need an alibi for about two hours. I drove back to Lansdale, about an hour outside of town, and sat down at Seattle's finest coffee shop. I told the girl behind the counter a joke, hoping she would remember me, and I remembered her name, Zoe. 
unusual enough to be legitimately memorable. I enjoyed a coffee and a 430-calorie muffin with a $4.86 receipt in my wallet, documenting that I was there at 3.45 p.m. and probably sometime after that. When the coffee cooled, I poured out the rest, went to the toilet, and headed home. On the husband, you know. Too much time on the road. Three nights out of five, I'm home alone. He takes me for granted. I have to tell him we're going to dinner. I have. To drag him to a concert. He never suggests doing anything together. Sometimes I wonder if he wants to be in the public eye with me. We've been married three years and it feels like 30. I married into the company. And Robert Campbell, a nice guy, traffic manager at work, is a nice company. We joked and flirted harmlessly for a few months. And then maybe not so harmlessly. Anyway, we started our affair about two months ago. The second time we did it at our house, he left his damn jacket at my house with a damn receipt for condoms. It was close. It was fun to have fun with him, but now the roses are blooming. I'm starting to notice more and more things he does that annoy me. For the past few weeks, Robert has been complaining about the cost of the motel. I didn't want to do it in an office, you know. Too many people at any time. I can't use his house. His wife is at home with the kids. Plus, it's far out of town, so, like a fool, we use my apartment. I was very careful, but it's dangerous. I knew that my husband would be away on a business trip this week, and as I said, I began to doubt my relationship with Robert. The husband was suspicious, and the thrill of sex with Robert had mostly gone away, meaning it was normal, but the ground wasn't moving or anything. I pushed Rob away last week, but agreed to this week as part of my plan to gradually get out of this affair. We left work early around noon. We each arrived in our own car and arrived together. I don't like doing this. It's too obvious, too dangerous. And we have a noisy neighbor, Mrs. Abdul, next door. I didn't understand what happened when, without warning, that bastard hit me in the face and such pain filled my mind. You wouldn't believe it. I screamed in shock and in damn pain. I think my nose is broken. Jesus. Finally, I was able to wriggle out from under him. In a panic, I looked around to see if he had, like, been shot or something. But everything was quiet. What the hell happened? I realized that I couldn't stay here. I wrapped a towel around my neck and face to catch the blood, returned to the living room, and dressed as best I could. Robert began to rise. Through the veil of agony, I screamed at him. He looked as stupid as a damn cow not knowing what he had done, so I hit him in the groin twice and he fell down again. Clean up this mess, you sick bastard. I'm going to the hospital and I'll deal with you later. The husband wasn't supposed to return until tomorrow, late at night at best. I should have called an ambulance. I really should have. What? I could barely see straight. I got into the car and drove out. What am I going to say at the hospital? Damn, forget the hospital. What am I going to tell my husband? Did I hit the door? Don't think. God, I think I'm going to die. I parked in the lot closest to the emergency room and hobbled towards the doors. Some black guy coming outside saw me, grabbed the wheelchair and ran towards me before I fell. I was having trouble explaining to the nurse at the counter that I had been beaten, which was what it was, by this crazy bastard. But no, lady, not this sweet man. He met me staggering towards the emergency room door. God, how was I supposed to know Bob was a psychopath? I just wanted some fun and company, you know. Damn, my face will be destroyed. They quickly checked for any fractures, while the nurses undressed me on the stretcher very professionally, right there, changing me into a gown while I heard them calling some doctor. A woman about 15 years older than me leaned towards me. Everything will be okay, honey. You're lucky. Dr. Sullivan is on duty today. He's the best plastic surgeon in the state. Definitely my lucky day, and to think I had no idea, until now, I purred. I didn't even think to call anyone to tell them where I was. These hospital people kept asking me questions. Damn, damn, damn. I answered questions and had no idea what I was saying. What did I really say? Damn, damn, damn. Everything became blurry. One and the other came up asking this and that. And then nothing. Nothing at all. If I had been conscious, I might have thought it was death, but I was not aware of anything. After a few minutes in the coffee shop, they became very busy, and I quietly got into the car and drove back home.
I was lucky to find a place right in front of the house. Gracie Abdul, my neighbor, greeted me as she raked her tiny lawn, and I told her how beautiful New York State was, practicing a lie about my whereabouts, I guess, and walked into the apartment. It was a slaughterhouse. My heart jumped, but I held back the urge to gag and made it to the kitchen sink, where I puked. There was no body, which means I didn't kill Campbell. There was blood everywhere, on the sofa, the carpet, the bathroom floor, footprints here and there. I wiped off the two legs of the stool I had touched and turned it so the clean legs were facing the wall and called 911 from my cell phone. I told the police that I had just come home and found blood all over the apartment and I didn't know where my wife was. They told me to wait outside, so I did. Mrs. Abdul was still there. I had only been in the house for a couple of minutes, so I told her what I saw. She was horrified. Oh my God, I didn't hear anything. We need to watch out for each other, like in the old days. You and I will be on the evening news. We will be on Channel 6. Speak for me, Gracie. I don't mind if you say anything, but I, I'm not going to say a word. It will be known throughout the area in an hour or so, and probably throughout Philadelphia within two hours. It was nice to see how quickly the police arrived. Our taxes are in action, and more police arrived until there were four cars on the street. I told both of them what I knew until a rather large black detective with hands the size of meat trays asked me to come to the station and give a formal statement. He spoke with a clear South Philly accent. Anything to help, officer. But at this point, I need to call my mother-in-law. She'll find out about this through rumors, and she'll kill me for not telling her first. Okay, kid. Do what you have to do. Get in the car and talk to her along the way. It didn't look like a movie at all. Would you believe it? My mother-in-law was not at home. I just left a message that I called with important news, and I would call back a little later in the evening. We went into the office where they read me my rights. Yes, I refused a lawyer, and the questions began. There wasn't much I could tell them. I'd been away all week. Where was I this afternoon? Well, I had most of my receipts in my briefcase in the car, some in my wallet, among other things. I had a check for lunch from mom and dad's restaurant in New York State, a check for admission to the French asylum where I said I spent about an hour and a half walking along the river, and a check from a Seattle coffee shop at 4 hour p.m., where I sat and checked my email for 15 to 20 minutes, mentioned the barista Zoe, and then drove about an hour home and made a call to the police. If you've never heard of French asylum, you're in good company. They've never heard of this place either. I had to spell it out for them, even though it was on the check. They ended up taking my photo and fingerprints and then letting me go, saying my apartment was a crime scene so I couldn't enter. And by the way, the wife was beaten, not in mortal danger, and was in Jefferson Hospital. I was really glad that she was more or less okay, really. As I said, in civilized countries, the punishment for what she did is divorce, not death. I complained to them that they kept me there when my wife was in real trouble and needed me, and got a ride back home with some policewoman to pick up my car. The excitement is almost over, only one police car. The other three were replaced by a white police van. The policewoman told me that I would probably be able to enter the house around 10 Yao Sao's p.m. or 11 Sao Sao's p.m. I told her I had a spare key so they could lock it when they were done and drop it in the mailbox. I headed to the hospital answering numerous calls left on my mobile by her mother, sister, and some aunts. There was complete chaos among the wife's relatives, I must say. At this point, I called my mom to give her as many details as I could, but since she lives 500 miles away, she could remain calm and objective. Plus, I really didn't know anything about her condition, except that it wasn't fatal. When I arrived at the waiting room, I held my in-laws until I checked in at the front desk. An elderly volunteer told me that the wife was still undergoing surgery, and besides, no one knew anything. My in-laws sat around and watched TV with their usual blank minds, and I told them the grisly details of an apartment full of blood, with bloody footprints from the bare feet of a man and a woman. My mother-in-law's husband, Danny, walked into the waiting room in the middle of it all, heard the end of the story and demanded to know, where have you been all this time, huh? I mean, you must have some kind of alibi, right? I wondered for a moment whether the fool was hinting that I might have done it. But I remembered that one should never attribute to malice 
that which can be explained by stupidity. I wouldn't call him stupid, but there's a reason he's never driven a manual car. I told him what I told the police briefly. This seemed satisfactory to him. My mother-in-law woke me up at 11 Sider p.m. to tell me that my wife was out of intensive care and we could take turns staying in the recovery room with her. I went in first and sat down to think, without any coherent thoughts. She was out of her mind, more or less incoherent. After some time, the mother-in-law burst in, despite the nurse's rules. The pain came to me from the darkness, but then moved away at some distance, almost as if it belonged to someone else. My mind drifted with it, and as peace began to settle in my mind, the pain came closer. There were people there, strangers and my mother, and they asked me questions that I couldn't understand. The nurse said, she's fine, she's coming out of the anesthesia, but it'll be an hour or two before she really comes around. Terrible, just terrible, muttered my mother. Why did you let a crazy stranger into your home? Or did you leave the door open? She should have known not to open the door to some crazy stranger. I heard my mother-in-law muttering and said with confidence, no doubt he left a lot of DNA behind so he will eventually be caught. The nurse said that she was still under the influence of anesthesia and would not remember anything. They would give her pain relief when they could and politely asked us to leave. I accepted my mother-in-law's offer of a bed in her spare room because I wasn't sure the police would allow me into my house. We arrived at the hospital the next morning as the police were leaving. They told me that the wife had given them a statement and I could return to the apartment at any time. The wife looked terrible. Two black eyes, huge bruises on his cheeks, reaching to his ears and down his neck, and bandages everywhere. I think as much for cosmetic reasons as to bandage wounds. I really wish I could just make a scene or something. It was just wrong and I couldn't admit it now. Um, she really looked terrible. Really. I stopped to talk to the nurses as her mother rushed past me inside and started asking a thousand questions. What happened? Did she know who did it? The wife claimed that she was attacked by an unknown assailant who hit her in the face, stunning her. He is believed to have then fled. It changed my public attitude. If she had admitted to having a lover, I might have given her the cold shoulder. But her statement made her the victim, and so I needed to appear supportive. As far as I knew, although it didn't look like rape, it probably was. I only saw them for a few seconds. I assumed it was Robert Campbell, but I had never met him, so I didn't really know who it was. I called sister wife's husband, Danny, to see if he could help me clean up the apartment after dinner. We agreed to meet at 16.0. I wanted my relatives to see the apartment. I called the wife's employer and spoke with her boss's secretary, Catherine, who I didn't know very well, but definitely better than anyone else at work. We chatted a bit at a couple of office parties. I told her that the wife was beaten and hit hard in the face and was undergoing reconstructive surgery. As a guest, she will likely be out for at least a week or two. Then I asked when she left work yesterday. A. I don't know if I noticed that, actually. Come on, Cat. You can see her desk from the comfort of your beautiful chair. Well, maybe around 2 uh, p.m. or a little later. Did anyone else leave at this time? Long pause. This is a criminal case, the police will also ask. They say that most attacks are committed by people they know. Catherine suggested. Well, I can't imagine that it's connected, but Bob Campbell left around the same time. But it's unlikely he could have done such a thing. I mean, he and your wife are friends, colleagues, you know. I have known him for many years already. Oh yes, friends. I told her I would keep her posted. I knew the names of most of Kenya's colleagues, but I had not met many of them. I knew his name because he belonged to the sports jacket. But I couldn't remember if I had met him. Except for the jacket incident. I don't think she ever mentioned it to me. So... I guess the first time I saw him was yesterday. Dr. Sullivan came in and told my mother-in-law and me that Jennifer would be out in a day or two, that everything had gone well, and that in a few weeks she would have to have one, maybe two surgeries to fix her nose. He put his folder down while he examined it, and I flipped through some of the pages, trying to see what I could. Among the tests for STDs, 
A positive result was noted for gonorrhea. I went to our family doctor to get tested for STDs and tell her what happened. She offered to stop by the hospital and make sure Jennifer was getting all the care she needed. Hmm, I rarely think about wife's real name unless I'm mad at her. I asked the doctor for STD test results as quickly as possible and was promised that they would be ready in 48 hours. Danny brought his sister Anne with him to help us clean up. They were duly shocked by the state of the apartment and realized what had happened. She was cleaning up the blood in the bathroom while Danny and I were dragging the couch to the curb when the big detective from last night, Leon Washington, showed up. The guy is really impressively huge, like a brick on his feet. Did I remember anything else? Or was there something missing? Then it dawned on me. You know, I'm missing a white shirt. I was in the closet, choosing clothes for Jennifer, and noticed that two of my shirts had fallen to the floor. I picked them up and noticed that one of the white shirts was missing. Come on, Mr. Harlow. How did you notice that one of your white shirts was missing? Detective Washington, let me show you. And I went into the bedroom and opened the closet. How many white shirts do you see? His eyebrows rose, and he said with a smile, Oh, so you only had one white shirt, that's right. Only one, and it's gone. I was at the paper mill this week and didn't take any shirts with me. Did you find my shirt in the trash by any chance? I mean, apparently the attacker got his dirty hands and took one of mine. He wrote down what I said and didn't give anything away. Do you consider this an attack? Officer Washington responded, That's one possibility, but we're still investigating. We eventually pulled out the carpet, and to my surprise, there was nice hardwood flooring underneath. I thought that there is no such thing as a little evil and rented a polishing machine on the way to the hospital. After I saw the wife at 19, oh, we had a formal meeting with the relatives, and after about 15 minutes we left the intrusive relatives. By 10 I had cleaned and waxed the floor. It turned out really good. I half expected a call from Jennifer, but the phone only rang a couple of times from her friends and mine. The next day, Catherine called to report that Campbell had been arrested in their office and taken away in handcuffs. This was the main topic of conversation in the building. That afternoon, the police came to my work. They were interested in the time again and wanted me to do it all over again. Apparently, I was driving very slowly. Well, no, detective. I wasn't driving particularly slowly. To be honest, I didn't have much of a need to rush home. I took the scenic roads where 55 in Mastempi was about the maximum that could be done, and I rode along with the same traffic. What I met. It was a beautiful day. Upstate New York and central Pennsylvania are really beautiful. I was in no rush. I stopped at a couple of antique stores because our wedding anniversary is coming up. Names? Yes, well, off the top of my head, I only remember one name and location, where I actually stopped and also went into another small one that I can't remember. It was after the first store, just a small shed with mostly old junk. I didn't have much reason to come home before dinner. I took the long way home. I gave him the route I took, in detail, with comments about where to turn and so on. I drew it on the map, tearing the map out of the atlas for them to take with them. With GPS, I don't need it anymore. They made copies of the checks and were a little more forthcoming about the generally more general aspects of the case. They admitted that Campbell was involved, his fingerprints were found in the blood in the apartment, and he apparently said he had been dating the wife for some time. The wife denied it and still claimed it was an assault. In addition, they were embarrassed by injuries. Whose injuries? Obviously, my wife's. But did he have any injuries? I ask. Well, your wife's injuries can be explained by him headbutting her, but then why do you think he did it? I have no idea. Slipped from his elbows? Hit by something? Some kind of seizure? How should I know? I don't think I've ever met him. You didn't say he had any injuries? Well, there's a pretty nasty bruise on the back of his head, but not too serious. Well, then she probably hit him. She does have a short temper. Mr. Harlow, what would you do if you came across such a scene? Detective Washington, I really don't know. I mean, we've all heard about people killing their spouse and lover, or filming them having sex and sending the photos to everyone they know. You know, public shaming, punishment, and all that. Let me think about it for a minute. Something I wouldn't do. Well, 
For starters, I've never hit a woman and I can't imagine ever doing it. A scoundrel is a different matter. When we were cleaning this room to remove the carpet, there was an empty 1.5-liter bottle of wine right next to the sofa. If I caught them having sex on the couch, I think I would grab her and hit him on the side of his head as hard as I could to crush his ear. If it hadn't thrown him off his wife, I would have grabbed him by the hair and pulled him off. I've never been in a real fight, but if I was, I wouldn't want it to be fair. When he fell to the ground, I would have punched him in the ribs several times. My voice has risen. I would grab him by the ankles and drag him bare bottom down the front steps. I might feel some urge to throw his clothes down the steps behind him, but I'm sure I'm not kind enough to give him a clean shirt from my own closet. Officer Leon had no more questions. I left work early and looked at a couple of apartments on Craigslist, agreeing to rent one on a monthly basis. What a damn hell I created for myself. They won't let me out of here until tomorrow at best, and I'll need another operation. If I confess to the affair, my marriage is over. If I sue for assault, Robert will pull out the receipts from the motel, and he probably kept some of the letters. On top of that, the doctor says, I have gonorrhea. Damn, damn, damn. The good news is that the antibiotics I take to prevent infection in my nose will also clear up the gonorrhea. The bad news is that it won't do anything for Chris if he is infected. The other good news is that I can choose my new nose from a catalog. Wonderful, simply wonderful. It couldn't be better. I just can't think of a believable story to tell Chris. Damn, damn, damn. I don't really know what happened, that is, other than the sex. I'll have to call Robert and tell him. I'll have to tell the truth. And the police, too. I spent the morning gathering what I needed to live in the apartment and taking out the things that belonged to me. I took the bed because it was my mother's, but left the mattress, assuming it had been desecrated by others. That afternoon, I made it to the hospital because the living mummy, who was currently still my wife, was about to be discharged. Well, love... Have you decided to become a Muslim? We can find something that will cover the rest, too. No sense of humor. She was silent on the way home. We still haven't talked about it. As she sat down in the only comfortable chair in the living room and picked up a cup of coffee, she said, You probably want to know what happened? It's a fair assumption, isn't it? I also want to know not only what happened that day, but what happened before it, and I want to know the truth. Forget about damage control. Your mom, your sister, your boss, your co-workers, police. Everyone knows you cheated. It can't be more public unless it's on TV. It was a big breach of trust. If you can't tell it like it is without a bunch of lies, then you better keep quiet until you can. She sighed and made a pained grimace. Well, you know Robert Campbell from work. No, I don't think I've ever met him. Wait, isn't he the transportation manager in the shipping department? No, this is Eddie Campbell, no relation to him. In fact, Robert is inside sales, and I was assigned to help him put together a presentation. Well, we went to the apartment the day before to pick up some things I forgot to bring. To work, and one thing led to another. A long pause, during which I thought, led to the sofa, huh? When she didn't continue, I asked, And? Unfortunately, I don't know what came over me. Robert Campbell's body, naked. This is what came over you, I thought, but said, and? Well, we started kissing, and, you know, what happened next? No, I don't know, because it ended with the apartment looking like a butcher's shop and our new couch, rugs, and my trust in you in the trash. It's a long way from kissing Robert, don't you think? Why did you start kissing with Robert, and what did you think this would lead to? Well, Robert is a good guy, and you were away a lot, and I guess I really needed someone. So in a weak moment, I was receptive. Were there others before Robert? Men or women? No, of course not. Not since I met you. And there never was a woman. I'm not like that. Well, Jennifer, I'm not sure what you're really like anymore. Honestly? Is that all? Honestly, before God. Ha! You were together the day you forgot your jacket, right? And this definitely wasn't the first time. She was dumbfounded, apparently didn't think about it. That's enough, Chris, there's no need to be rude. Think about your version of events, because it is literally unbelievable. It takes several weeks for gonorrhea to be detected in the blood. I'll come by after work tomorrow to see if you need anything. We can talk again when you're inclined to stop lying to me.
I'll leave my cell phone on in case anything happens, but please only use it for emergencies. I headed to the door and opened it. Wait, where are you going? Home. I rented an apartment in a not-so-great area of Chestnut Hill. I'll be living there. I called the property's managers to let them know that I won't be renewing the lease, but that you might want to and will have to notify them. But I can't. I didn't hear the rest of her sentence because I closed the door and walked down the steps. She was in for an uncomfortable night or two, sleeping on a bare mattress, because I had taken our bed and dresser, and most of the lamps, as they were family antiques. It took a long time to find out from her what happened and why. After retelling the story several times, the first time may have been the day he forgot his jacket. They had sex twice more, including the time she was injured. Getting hurt and being trapped scared her a lot, so she stopped it. Gee. Well, it was so public that anyone with a sense of shame would be ashamed. I decided to stay with her during the surgeries as a friend. I also installed a tracker in her car, trying to check and verify it as insurance. The reasons for her betrayal were difficult to understand. My business trips meant loneliness and boredom for her at home, and added to this was boredom at work, all of which overwhelmed her. I reduced my business travel as much as possible, which reduced the business's profits a little, but it was cheaper than a divorce. We went to counseling, which helped me by learning to talk openly with each other, which was really difficult for me, but I don't think she was as open to it as I was. I never admitted that I ruined her face, but I have to say, that's probably one of the reasons why I stayed with her during the surgeries, and I wanted to save our marriage after spending about five years of my life on it, and I really loved her. Four weeks after she returned to work, I saw in the tracking program that her car left the parking garage at 3 p.m. and was parked several miles away. Google Earth showed it was the Quality Inn. I drove there and was rewarded by the sight of her and Campbell coming out a little after 5.30 p.m. I went home and took out the divorce papers that I had prepared in advance. The next day, I signed a one-year lease for the apartment I was living in, which saved me 20% of my rent. I was sitting on the steps when she came home from work. I asked her to sit down and just told her straight out, I thought a lot about us and came to the conclusion that deep down, I think you are a lying bastard and I don't want to waste any more of my time on you. Having said that, go with God, don't bother me anymore, I want to forget you. No, this is the wrong decision. We are on the right path to repairing our relationship. Don't give up on us. You're saying this after spending yesterday afternoon with Campbell in a motel room? Screw you and that horse you were riding on. You, I've arrived. I regret the day I first saw you. I'm done with her. I gave her the divorce papers and could have given her my wedding ring, but the gold was $800. As for her nose reconstruction, she thought about a smaller, trendier, upturned nose, but opted for something very close to her old one. She had a fairly large nose, which I thought looked normal, and the new one was slightly smaller, but the same general shape. Old friends noticed that something had changed, but could not understand what exactly. I haven't spoken to my ex-in-laws or ex-wife since then. I didn't care about them. Someone said Campbell was her lover for a while after I left. For their health, let them exchange STDs. It's been six months and I'm finally feeling good. The rage and pain of her betrayal, my guilt over the injuries he caused, the involvement of the police, all of this took a big chunk out of my life. I think it would be better for me, and of course for her too, if I just faced the betrayal. I suffered greatly from the guilt of disfiguring her and spent months helping her deal with the trauma, seeing her suffer physically from the surgeries and mentally from the remorse of cheating, which gave me time to accept it as a short-term mistake on her part. But, as I soon realized, history would repeat itself in the future. If I hadn't attacked them but confronted them, I probably could have divorced her on the spot and ended up with her cheating. Instead, I experienced the pain of betrayal and came to the point of accepting her sincerity and her words. Stupid of me. So when she went back to this guy, I did it right the second time and kicked her out the door and it was over in a matter of minutes. Much easier. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.